This is a summary of the 15th season of The Debbie and Carrie Show. Richard Sims reports to Debbie that his elementary school is planning to have either a strict dress code for the children or require school uniforms. Debbie goes to the principal to state her opposition to this move, fearing it will violate the rights of the students and make the school seem like a military organization. Emily Chan goes to the Speedy Burgers diner and tries to rob it. But the robbery is interrupted by Carrie, who is then shot by Emily. This reckless act causes the others in the diner to attack and disarm Emily even before the police arrive to arrest her and take Carrie to the hospital. Dr. Ferris and Dr. Drake perform surgery on Carrie to remove the bullet lodged in one of her lungs. Meanwhile, Carrie has a vision in which she sees her grandmother Kelly Sims, who died many years ago and encourages Carrie to fight for her life. Emily is visited in jail by her mother, who tells her that because she is now a criminal, she will be disowned by her parents. As soon as Carrie recovers from the surgery, she returns to the diner, where she meets with police chief Theodore Root. Carrie then asks to rejoin the police force, wanting to give back to the people who saved her. Root agrees. While on patrol a week later, Carrie is told she may be up for promotion to police chief, because both police chief Root and Sergeant Kelly Grimm are quitting the police force, Root to move back to Boston to take care of his mother, and Grimm because she is pregnant. Eventually, Root and Grimm do leave the force and Carrie is thus promoted. The very day she becomes police chief, she faces her first serious challenge, a group calling themselves the Order of the White Skull staged a protest in front of the Tuscany Tavern, disrupting its business. Carrie then has her cops attack the protesters, and the leader of the protest is then arrested. And he turns out to be Nicholas Owen, son of Dave Owen who staged a similar protest. And like his father, he is jailed and humiliated. Jack Watson is serving in the army under the scornful eye of his commanding sergeant, who thinks Watson shouldn't be a soldier and belongs in prison. The Tuscany Tavern now signs a deal with the Atlantic Fisheries, a seafood restaurant Jane, and take on board an experienced seafood chef, Rena. But conflict erupts quickly between Chef Rena and Penny Bentley Smith, the head cook at the restaurant. Penny complains to Lucy about it. Lucy in turn contacts the CEO of the Atlantic Fisheries about the matter. And that CEO wastes no time in laying down the law to Chef Rena. Obey Penny's commands or Rena gets fired. And so Rena is forced to apologize for her defiant attitude. With Vicky Sims, daughter of Lucy and Jessica, and Paul Jenkins, nephew of Carla, having left for Boston, Carla asks to move in with the Sims couple to save money and to relieve their sense of empty nest syndrome. The Sims couple agrees to this. Meanwhile, Faye Donaldson, a former member of Imelda Sirkame's gang, offers an apology to Vicky for what she and the others in their gang did to Vicky. And Vicky forgives her. Suzanne Hudson is now running for a seat in the California State House of Representatives, hoping to unseat a Republican there. Tommy Hudson's relationship with Gabrielle Nuria has deepened to the point that they have decided to get married. But there's trouble. Mary Park Hudson, daughter of Laura and Suzanne, reports that a bigger boy tried to rape her. So Laura goes to her daughter's school to report the matter to the principal, only to learn that the child rapist, Oliver, is the principal's own son. So embarrassed is the principal over this that she resigns from her job and has Oliver arrested for his terrible acts. In the Texas town, Debbie now plans to run for mayor of the town and she naturally gets the backing of her own mother. But Jessica persuades Debbie that she should first serve as a member of the town's ruling council, so Jessica steps down from her place in it and appoints Debbie her successor. Simon Wilson now reports to Sandy Smith that his brother Leonard, who Sandy helped send to prison, is dead of lung cancer. After leaving the police force, Kelly Grimm joins her husband Matt Lazinski as a partner in his tech store. An awkward situation results when Kelly's ex-boyfriend Randall shows up and asks for a job at the tech store. Matt refuses and kicks Randall out of the store. Kelly then files a complaint about Randall, and then... Randall asks to be made a cop, because he once served as a cop in the town, but Carrie rejects him immediately. To protect Kelly from being further harassed by Randall, Carrie persuades Kelly to take back her place as a sergeant in the town's police department. In addition, Carrie has other cops, and even Debbie follow Randall around the town, as he tries to get a job at the Tuscany Tavern. The Speedy Burgers Diner In the town's high school, 
but the supervisors at all these places have already been warned by Carrie about Randall, and so he is rejected at most of the places he goes to. Finally, Randall is hired by a local construction company that repairs the roads of the town, but only because the company needs more workers. The faithful remnant now is breaking into prisons to release inmates that they can recruit to serve their cause, including Ted Anderson, Ted Wilson, George Dawson and Don Dacron. They have now morphed into a terrorist organization dedicated to overthrowing America's secular government. In Boston, Vicky is now old enough to be allowed access to her adoption agency's records regarding her younger sister, Tanya. Vicky and Paul then go to the mansion where Tanya is living. And they meet Tanya's adoptive mother, who tells them that she told Tanya that her birth mother died soon after she was born and that she never had a sister, much to Vicky's dismay. Then Vicky gets to see Tanya who reveals that she already knows the truth about her and Vicky's birth mother and of Vicky's existence. Vicky persuades Tanya to keep their meeting secret to avoid a rift between Tanya and her adoptive mother. Back in the Texas town, Rose Owen, Whitney's grandmother, is diagnosed with a terminal heart condition. Just before she dies, Rose makes her granddaughter promise to do what she can to destroy her grandfather's legacy, something Whitney was already dedicated to doing. Whitney then has one final confrontation with her father Nicholas over Rose Owen's death. They part on extremely bitter terms. Nicholas Owen now gathers with other faithful remnant leaders in Idaho, where they agree to launch an attack on Austin, the capital of Texas, to try to take over the state. It's all about starting a new civil war slash revolution to create a theocracy. Debbie is now the newest member of the town's ruling council and gets a crash course in how to take part in the town's government as a stepping stone to become its mayor someday. Nicholas Owen now hosts a rally of his followers, using standard conservative slash right-wing extremist rhetoric to justify his mission to overthrow the state government of Texas. But Don Dacron decides this plan is madness and so. He exposes the conspiracy to Mayor Florence, who in turn warns the Texas state and American federal authorities. The army group that Jack Watson is a member of is now ordered to go to Austin to protect the city from the militia forces preparing to attack it. Mayor Florence now assembles his own militia forces in the town, including members of the police department, fire department, and the town's road repair and construction crew, along with many other volunteers. Randall refuses to take part in the upcoming battle and that is all the reason construction leader Bullock needs to fire him. Also refusing to take part is George Dawson, who deserts the faithful remnant and comes to his mother seeing refuge. But then his mother and sisters proceed to beat him mercilessly as revenge for his past crimes, including his beating of his sister Hermine. And then he is sent back to prison. Sandy Smith meets with Army General Bradley in Austin to tell him about the Loyalist militia from her town. Then she meets with Don Dacron, who has already arrived in Austin, and makes a deal with him to represent him in court as his attorney to get him a pardon for his past crimes. Mayor Florence then leads his militia to Austin, where he meets with General Bradley. Bradley stations the town's militia in front of the Texas State Capitol as a last line of defense in case the faithful remnant breaks through the U.S. Army's defenses. As expected, dozens of armed groups from various states link up at Amarillo, Texas, and then rush toward Austin as a single rebel army, several thousand strong. General Bradley orders his army to go to battle. At first, it is indeed like the start of the American Civil War all over again. But in fact the faithful remnant never really stood a chance. The US Army forces crushed them in only a few hours, inflicting heavy casualties, including Ted Wilson, Nicholas Owen, and Ted Anderson. Their deaths break the back of the faithful remnant militia's command structure and so the militia is completely defeated. None of the members of the loyalist militia from the town were ever in danger. Jack Watson did take part in the battle and his combat performance so impressed his commanding sergeant that he recommended that Jack remain in the army, though he also agreed that Jack deserved the pardon as a reward for his efforts in the battle. The members of the town's loyalist militia, including Carrie, return to be greeted as heroes and the town throws a celebration in their honor. And so ends the 15th season of the Dubby and Carrie show.